I feel like fame is one of the most traumatic things that can happen to someone. There's cult-like behavior happening. Maybe the people that dive deep don't have the most recognition, but they have the most power. Do you really want to be the biggest or do you want to really build a business? Where do you think that blogging is going and Instagram? What is a trend that you have predicted that have been 100% right? No one was talking about it back then. The whole vibe has come back. What marketing trends do you think are up and coming? Oh my gosh. Go off. I'm doing that voice because she has a voice that she does on TikTok, Michael. It's like a very alluring, sexy voice. I go, hi, I'm Coco Moco, and I've made a career off of accurately predicting rising trends in stores. And it's like people come up to me on the street and like recite it. It's, it's, it's just like it's a smart. catchy thing. Well, it's yeah. kind of soothing, to be honest. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, it's so funny. I never thought I had like a calming voice, but I think I get like nervous when I go to film and it gets like quiet. And usually my boyfriend's in the room like sleeping or something. So I'm like quiet. And people are like, why are you whispering? I'm like, I don't want to wake him up. But yeah. Lord, are you taking note, Lauren? Because <laughs> yeah, I, I have the right. exact opposite experience. You know? Oh, really? yeah. I'm sleeping and it's like an eagle screeching in the background. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think I just get jealous when he's sleeping and I'm not sleeping. <laughs> yes. So I'm like, a really, really obnoxious. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yes. Yeah. It's so funny. My boyfriend always says he's like, I need to start a support group for like partners of content creators, like him having to like hold the phone and film and stuff. But you yeah. see, um, because he made a huge mistake. And what I did from the beginning is I set the bar so low. I yeah. take terrible pictures. I don't yeah. hold the phone because I knew if I did, I was signing up for a lifetime of pain. Yes. Well, and you guys have been doing the podcast forever. Like this is so for so full circle because I used to listen when I was at San Diego State, like walking down Camp and I away, I would like listen to the podcast. What do you mean used to? I you know, you're still I don't know. <laughs> no, still, but like that was my first introduction. And it's just so crazy. Like that is crazy. Right. And that's why I wanted you on the podcast because you have had a crazy mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we talked off air. I do feel like you've blown up, but it sounds like there was a lot of bricks that you laid to yeah. get here. And I I think it's amazing that you used to listen to us at San Diego State mm -hmm. and now you're here. Um, yeah. I feel like that makes people feel like they can sort of create their own future. Yeah. And like, I know for me, um, especially just in the context of college, I was always so sad that I wasn't like in a sorority or things like that. And I was like, I'm not going to have any connections to get into marketing and stuff like that. And then, um, I mean, I think part of it was luck when I did get into it. But when I got my marketing degree, I was like, I will do marketing for a lawnmower company. Like, I don't care, like whatever I can do. And I saw a Craigslist ad and it was like, uh, we, we need someone to do marketing at this company in Santa Monica, but we can't tell you like what it is. And so I applied and then it ended up being famous birthdays, which is so funny. It's like a hot pink website for like 12 year olds. And, um, and so I went in and at the time they were interviewing a lot of like musically and YouTubers and stuff. And um, so that was kind of how I got my start. And that was where like the whole entertainment side of it came in. But does all that site does is just pull known people's birthdays? Yeah, it's honestly so fascinating. Like I always sing their praises because I think they're so interesting. Um, it basically it's a website about famous people's birthdays. But when the guy who made it, Evan Britton, he thought it was going to be people searching like Beyonce and Lady Gaga. And he thought that there was typos because people were searching like Jacob Sartorius and like Lauren Gray. And he's like, who are these people? And then he realized that no one was covering like these influencers. So he started reaching out and then they would send them their birthday, some info. And then he would invite them into the LA office and interview them because no one else was interviewing them at the time. Like it just mainstream media wasn't really looking at influencers that way. And so he just built this devoted following of like Gen Z when they were like in fifth and sixth grade. And um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 just so fascinating. They can always tell when someone's going to get famous because they get like the data of like searches and stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Oh my God, that's mm -hmm. crazy. They, yeah. they reached out to me like my fourth <laughs> year in my career to mm -hmm. put me on their site. So do you think that they use the data of people searching to reach out to me? Yeah. So if they reach out to you, it's because your name was spiking in searches. 
and they like wanted to get you on the site. So then they would have a landing page. Carson, go see if I'm on there. <laughs> Let's actually see if Michael's on there. Yeah. Carson, tell us if Michael's oh on there. Oh my God. It's going to not be good for me if I'm not on there. I think it's going to be it's gonna so, really be calling I hope my, he's not right. on there. Well, I hope I don't, it's just me. I don't think I've talked to anybody over there. So nope, I don't. But I guess they could like pull sometimes it anyways. They can. Yeah. Like though, sometimes if there's someone super like growing and they really want a landing page, they'll kind of guess it. And they'll like go on people's Instagram and like see when they posted like a a birthday thing and like around what day that was. And so, yeah, there's different ways that they'll like kind of guess. But Carson, what's the, what's the verdict? I'm on there. Oh, He's God. on there? Oh, I'm relevant. I'm relevant. <laughs> yeah, that means right. people are searching. Oh yeah. my God, All we right. cannot stroke the ego. <laughs> Do right. not even stroke the ego. I hope it says he's 87 years old and he's about to die. <laughs> but you know, we were talking about right before, and I thought it was an interesting topic to bring up as we're mm-hmm. as we're discussing fame in general. And you were yeah. saying that like you just what you you watched or you read the Britney book? Mm-hmm. Obviously. Yeah. So I'd been, I mean, I like who hadn't been following her story, but um I ordered the book on Amazon. It arrives when I get home from my flight. But I feel like she's such a good example. I guess where I kind of got my rise on TikTok is I would tell people like how to get famous or like what I thought was going to be trendy. But I also realized that there was this uh, double-edged sword of like, I felt like I also had to warn people that I feel like fame is like one of the most traumatic things that can happen to someone. And also for some people, sometimes the most dangerous thing that can happen to someone And I think Britney is such an example of that. Like she's even someone that like I don't even make many marketing videos about because I'm like, I feel like she almost doesn't even want the attention in a way. Like I don't think it's ever intentional or strategic with her. I think she just was so unique. And like for whatever reason, everyone like became obsessed with her. And I think it was weaponized in some ways, too. I just finished her book Mm -hmm. and you you it's really a tough read because yeah. she is a victim like mm-hmm. when you're reading it and you read what she went through it is an unusual life with a lot of abuse there's cult like behavior happening her father who was a horrible alcoholic when she was a little girl and was horrible to her her entire childhood grew up and essentially took control of her money took Mm -hmm. control of when she went to the bathroom, put video cameras in the room when she was with men. He recorded her phone calls. He paid himself $6 million a year out of her money and then would distribute her money to other people. He would have bodyguards for himself that he paid for. He was controlling every minute of her life. She wasn't allowed to have any alcohol. He put her in a mental institution and rehab. I mean, I could go on and on. And, And the craziest thing is she could do nothing about it because she was in this conservatory ship. Is that how Mm -hmm. you say it? Yeah. Conservatorship. Conservatorship. And, and she literally could do nothing. Like there was Mm -hmm. nothing in in the book. She, I honestly don't know what advice I would give her. She's helpless in the whole. Well, she's like, she's like the most extreme example, but I think what's interesting Mm -hmm. on like on this topic, we get to meet so many I guess, different walks of fame doing this show. Mm-hmm. Right? Like you see people that are like, quote unquote, the A-list down. People that are like just kind of breaking through. And what we've talked about here is I think there's a point in fame where if you want to peel it back, you no longer have the possibility to do so. Yeah. Like I, I like, I, I consider Lauren and I known entities, but not quote unquote famous. Like mm-hmm. we can walk down streets without people. Some people know, but you yeah. know, and I, and, and I think, that is kind of like a, a healthy space to be in, at least for us. But we've also met people where they've become so famous mm-hmm. that they're at the point where even if they wanted to peel a bag, like, I don't want this anymore. It's almost, it's too late. It's too far. I think yeah. that's when people sometimes, at least that we've met, re-examine their relationship with it because they're like, shit, yeah. now there's like, you're famous. You can't do anything about it. Yeah. My friend Nikki said it perfectly. He was like, celebrities almost become so superhuman that they become subhuman. Like, people no longer see them as human and that in a way kind of hurts them. And like, I definitely believe not for everyone, but it's not my own original thought. I've just heard it before, but that household name type of fame can stunt people at the age that they become famous. And it really makes you empathize with a lot of people that like, 
is someone like Michael Jackson. He had the mannerisms of someone who was maybe eight or nine. And like that was the age that he became super famous. And like Britney Spears in some way, I think sometimes seems like maybe 16 or like seems very young. And it's like they I feel like part of that is they'll never have another normal interaction ever again. Like they can never just meet a stranger and like learn about themselves through that person or like everyone always sees them as the person that they were when they got famous. And so they never really get to grow unless they're they have a good a system around them. Yeah, but. I think the, the problem is do like people don't stop to ask, like, do you really want to be famous mm-hmm. or do you want the things that you perceive to come with fame? Right. Yeah. Whether that's money or access or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think in a perfect world, you would have all the stuff but without that kind of note. I mean, because yeah. to your point, like I, I think my personal hell would be to be stuck in a restaurant to the point where like you can't walk through and people yeah. are just staring at you. Like, well, that's, th- there was that video and yeah. she talks about it in her book too of when Britney Spears is getting out of an Uber and you would die. She's She is pregnant and she's holding her 18 month old in her hands and the paparazzi is not letting her go through. They're pushing her wow. and she is so defeated that she just goes into a restaurant and starts crying and she's this pregnant woman she's not wearing makeup which is just like leave her alone like she's just she just wants to be left alone and her baby's in her arms and she's just sitting there just crying and she can't leave the restaurant because there's so many people outside like it was just it was very very suffocating I'm curious to know because you are so on the pulse of trends Mm -hmm. how you think people who have gained a huge TikTok following quickly What's going to happen to them in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I feel like the most recent example would be someone like Alex Earl. I think that we're also at a point where like fame is so fragmented now, like it's not as likely to have so many different like back then there were maybe five people that got famous a year, if even now there's like 30 to 100 people. I mean, there could be someone with a TikTok following of 10 million and I meet them at an event and I'm like, I've never seen them before. So I think that it's not going to be as extreme because of how many people are famous. I think specifically Gen Alpha, they're like the middle schoolers. They're the ones under Gen Z. I feel like they, of course, are obsessed with influencers, but they almost are going to see it as like not as interesting as maybe Gen Z and millennials saw influencers because I think to them it's going to be such a common job. And of course, it's still unique and there's a lot of luck and prestige that comes with it. But I think that it's just going to be so many people are famous that it's not as catastrophic when it does happen to someone. Isn't it interesting that Andy Warhol said that in the future, everyone's going to have their 15 minutes of fame? Yeah. I think about that every day. Like Mm -hmm. the Roman Empire thing on TikTok, that's my Roman Empire. I think about that quote every single day. Don't try to talk about the Roman Empire. (laughs) Don't try to get get on trend. I'm not trying to get on trend, but how often do you think about it? No, no. I mean, how often? No, how often? Okay. How often? Honestly, if I'm not, if I'm not trying to even follow the trend, honestly, like maybe once every two months. And it's because, <laughs> because, well, I'm interested in those books. Like I read, yeah. I, I read a lot of history. And so I, mm-hmm. you know, and also because okay. it was like the greatest empire. Well, anyway, my, but, my Ro- yeah. Roman empire is, is, uh, no, but Andy Warhol. you know, you're so right because doing what I do now at Dear Media, mm-hmm. not to knock anyone, but sometimes talent or whatever will come through this door and they'll be huge. Like they're huge names yeah. in their own kind of like niche of fame on the internet. And I will have I'll have to do research and be like, who is that? Mm-hmm. And it's it's most likely because maybe I'm not the target. But yeah. to your point, like back in the day, there was only a select few people that kind of broke through. This mm-hmm. happened with musicians too, right? Like yeah. if you were a band, only a few bands broke through. Now everybody, like they could be the yeah. biggest band in the world. You have no idea who they are. And I think there's just because there's so many fragmented audiences online and there's so many more people online mm-hmm. that accumulating an audience of a few million people is, is extremely hard and it's sizable. But there's a billion people online. Right. Yeah. I'm more interested in people that are able to like hold on to it because I feel like going viral isn't that interesting anymore, but people that can like stay in the public conscience for like a long period of time. Like to me, that's so fascinating. I think very difficult to do. The, the people I feel the worst for, because to your point, I mean, mm-hmm. not to age ourselves, but Lauren and I have been <laughs> doing this for a while and we've seen a lot of kind of people come and go and, yeah. and some, you know, um, come quicker and go faster than others. And mm-hmm. I, I always find it to be a shame when you see somebody garnish a ton of attention online early and they grow really fast. Mm-hmm. 
And then the sharks swarm and you get all these different managers and agents and people. Yeah. And they're like the hot thing of the moment. And then a year later, like they're kind of just like spit out and washed out. And unfortunately, I think that happens because, and I can you can see how it happens. They think like this never ending growth is never going to stop. But like you have to figure out how to have some longevity in whatever space you're going into. Yeah. You have to like always reinvent yourself. And to the point about managers, like I felt like even at Famous Birthdays, I saw that so much where it sounds so funny. Like Famous Birthdays, you think is this kitty site, but like we would have all of these TikTokers come in and YouTubers that were getting famous and maybe only 10% of them would have longevity, like the Charlie D'Amelio's and the Addison Ray's. And there were so many of them that had just like the shadiest managers. And it was worse when they were like young, like when they were like 15 and not that anything like bad was going on. It was just like, they didn't have like the tools to like know how to intuitively tell if it was like a bad manager or not. And that's why I always say too, I'm like, I feel like people should get famous after their like frontal cortex is like finished developing. Like people that get famous when they're like 25 or older, I think are able to sustain it more because they're just like more aware. There are three drinks that I drink every single morning. One is my raw milk with coffee with nugget ice. I also love a lemon water. Sometimes I add my deep bloating drops to it. And then I drink AG1. Okay. I started drinking this daily when I heard about it on Huberman's podcast. And then my husband, Michael, was like, you need to drink this. You need to try this. This is such a great morning ritual. And it's a great way to get a bunch of vitamins, prebiotics, probiotics, digestive enzymes for gut support. It has magnesium, B vitamins, basically all the things in one beautiful scoop. And I sort of started on my own. I froth it up with a lot of ice and water and I'll just drink it down. I think it tastes so good. I've recommended AG1 to a bunch of my friends and family. I recommended it to my dad. He's implemented it into his day. If you're a longtime listener, you know that Michael and I have been drinking AG1 for like the past year. I think Michael even two years. He likes to do it first thing in the morning. I like to wait about an hour on that note, AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner of the show so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D, 3K2, and 5-3 AG1 travel packets with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash skinny. That's drinkag1.com slash skinny. Check it out. When Lauren's right, she's right. I have to give her credit here. Let's talk about Branch Basics. If you're like me, one of the many unfortunate people that grew up with all sorts of chemical household cleaning supplies, never knowing the difference, never knowing a better way, well, then I have something for you, and that is Branch Basics. Clean without compromise, Branch Basics is free of fragrance, hormone disruptors, and harmful preservatives that wreak havoc on our health. It wasn't until Lauren battered me down and said, we're changing all of the household cleaning supplies that I absolutely noticed a difference. Now, anytime I walk into a house that doesn't use natural cleaning supplies or a hotel, immediately I can tell the difference. I feel lethargic. I feel slow. My brain gets a little foggy. And what I've noticed since I've implemented Branch Basics into the house is that I feel much more energy. I don't feel brain fog. And here's the thing. Once I got educated, on all the terrible things that they put into most household cleaning supplies, even the ones that they greenwash, it was to me a no-brainer to switch them out. Why would I want my dogs or my children having chemicals in their system or being exposed to them? Their premium starter kit replaces all of your harmful cleaning products in the home. Branch Basics now has a new luxurious gel hand soap that we just implemented into the house as well, made with only the safest ingredients to nourish your skin. It really is a no-brainer. It's cost-effective. And of course, we have an offer for you. Get those nasty chemicals out of your house and save 15% on your starter kit or their new hand soap when you use code SKINNY at www.branchbasics.com. Again, that is code SKINNY for 15% off when you purchase a starter kit or their new gel hand so branchbasics.com code skinny. I was introduced to Prolon, the cleanse from Tinks. Tinks was on Instagram story and she was just talking about how much she liked the specific cleanse. It's kind of like a fast. And I started trying it. I did it like probably four times, loved the cleanse. And then Prolong recently launched a fasting shake. I think this is so interesting because the Prolon fasting shake is scientifically proven to mimic the fasting state without spiking blood sugar. It's also designed to maintain a fasting fat burning state longer while keeping the body satisfied. So 
If you want to intermittent fast, I know Brooke Burke came on and she raved about intermittent fasting. This is such a great way to do it because it's not going to take you out of your fasted state, but you're going to feel satisfied. Of course, their shake is vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, soy-free. And it's also, which I think is so cool, packed with 21 vitamins and minerals. So if you're looking to sort of step your toe into intermittent fasting and you want the benefits such as weight loss and increased energy, this is a good way to do it because you won't feel like you're hungry because you have this Prolon Fasting Shake. Get ready for 2024. Order the Prolon Fasting Shake today. Right now, our listeners can save 15% off when you go to prolonglife.com slash skinny and use code skinny at checkout. That's 15% off at P-R-O-L-O-N life.com slash skinny. Prolonglife.com slash skinny. You get 15% off your order. A hundred percent agree with you. If you had tried to get me famous at 12, I like would have been represented by John Robert Powers. Like you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think like, listen, there's a lot of phenomenal agents and managers, but I think for every good one, there's 10 bad ones. And I don't mean to knock on it, but they're just people that maybe they're in that space. They're a little predatory. They don't have talents, best interests at heart for long-term decision-making. They put them in deals that are going to bring short-term dollars, but aren't going to build their brand Mm long-term. And, and, and again, it's like, I think if I was speaking to any young person that finds success in this space, like you really have to do your homework and find vetted talent and management agencies and companies, because there are some really good ones out there, but there's some people that get in the space. Like I meet people and I'm like, how the hell are you like, like, I've never heard of your company. What are you doing? But they have this really big talent for that moment of time. And you're kind of just like, how did this person get in bed with this person? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the worst is like when you can tell they just hired like their friends who like maybe don't have the best intentions. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like, if someone would come in for an interview, I'm like, like, why do you have like 30 people on payroll? Like, and they're all like, are they really doing anything? Are they just like here? Like, like I felt like the worst was like when they had like a lot of their friends around them that they were paying. And I felt like that was always where it got like super dicey. It's kind of like an athlete. Yeah. I want to talk about how you became a digital trend forecaster and a marketing specialist, but let's go way back to when you were a little girl. Have you always been someone that was curious about what was up and coming? Like, how does one Mm -hmm. even fall into this? Yeah. So I always, I always reference also just like my astrology. I'm a Gemini moon, Aquarius sun. And are you a Gemini and my daughter's an Aquarius? That's the best. Yeah. See, I love Gemini. Yeah. (laughs) But how do you be both? I don't know. I don't get it. So yeah, there's like different parts to your chart, but, um, (laughs) Yeah. So Gemini involves technology. Aquarius involves the future. So for me, when I was super young, I remember when I was in middle school, that's when MySpace came around and I was like sickly obsessed with it. Like I remember I'd be at school and I would like speed walk home so that I could figure out how to go on Google and make glitter fall from like the top of the page when you, as if anyone was going on my profile, they weren't. But to me, I thought that like millions of eyes were on my MySpace profile. And so I was just so obsessed with the internet and like why certain people would get attention. But of course I was like young. I didn't understand exactly where that was coming from. And then in high school, it was the tumblers that I was obsessed with. And then college, I thought I was going to be a journalist. I even studied or I read the books of like Diane Sawyer, Christine Armapour, all these journalists. And then I couldn't pass this grammar, spelling and punctuation test. Like I took it multiple times and I could not pass it. And so I got kicked out of the journalism school and I went to a counselor and they were like, well, something similar is marketing. Like you could try marketing. And I, I cannot imagine myself as a journalist now. I think journalism is so hard. Um, and so then that was how I got into marketing. And I mean, I had always been just obsessed with like why people's attention goes to certain areas. And with trends specifically, I think when I first started blowing up, it was because I was talking about makeup and fashion trends. But I think I was like put into this bucket of a trend forecaster in terms of like fashion and clothing. But that's not really what I am. I think I'm more of a digital forecaster. And I remember even some like verified, I think she's like a freelance writer for some big publications. And I was so devastated because she made a video and was like, stop tagging me in that girl's videos. Like she has no credentials. She has never written for a fashion magazine. Like she doesn't know what she's talking about. And I remember being like so sad because I was like, we're talking about like smudged mascara and like glitter eyeliner. Like, like 
I, I don't want to discourage anyone who maybe like doesn't have access to a Vogue internship to like start posting videos and come in our lane. But anyway, so I got put in the fashion bucket when I started blowing up like last year, but I've always been a digital forecaster. I was at Famous Birthdays and then I went to BuzzFeed for three and a half years. And my job was to really just like go into meetings and tell them like what I thought was coming, how they can make videos with certain brands regarding different trends. And how are you figuring most of that out? Uh, just spending time on it, really listening. I always say like every platform is its own language and you have to learn the languages and also being a good listener because what I see a lot of brands and even celebrities that try to get on TikTok or whatever do wrong. I use the analogy of it's like going to a small like kickback or party. And if you want to get attention and you want to make friends and be the coolest person in the room, like that's fine. But you can't just walk up to a group of people and be like, hi, this is me. I'm funny. Follow me. I'm so cool. They're going to like ignore you and then turn around. You have to stand there for a few minutes. You have to listen to what they're saying. What are the conversations? Do you have something of value to add? Then you can maybe chime in. So I think of platforms like that. Like I'm just the listener because brands or celebrities don't always have time to listen to what all the conversations are. I think that's super smart. And that's why I came to you and was <laughs> like, I need to hire you. So Coco and I have been working mm-hmm. together for like three months and you have you have helped make it digestible mm-hmm. about how to come into the party, if you will. Yeah. So I guess my first question off this is when someone tells you that, you don't have the credentials to come into a space. (laughs) Mm -hmm. How do you respond? Because someone, when I first started blogging said, what do you mean you're blogging? You don't have the credentials of a nutritionist. And I think a lot of people get deterred by that Mm -hmm. if they hear that when they're entering a field. Well, they've said it to us at every turn on every, on every kind of me. Like, I I think that's a lot Mm -hmm. of, a lot of people who have had success have sort of paved through that. Can you talk about that? But I also think that as part of that though, is I also think that, we've grown up in a culture where people feel you need like permission from some kind of degree or some Mm -hmm. kind of person that's been like to be able to enter a space. And I understand that if you're going into a medical field or whatever, but I I, I don't like for me, I don't, I never felt I needed permission to just start doing this on a mic. Yeah. No, I mean, it's such like good questions because that's something I'm like so passionately feel is that one, like if you are, again, of course, like trying to cure cancer or telling someone how to build like a rocket ship, you have to have a degree and like have an understanding there. But with the fields that we're in, that's more like creative and uh, storytelling, uh, a lot of times it's, it is intuitive, but what really got me is I, I'm very privileged that like I had a college education and I'm very privileged that like I am a, you know, a, a white woman who was able to get her foot in in the door at huge companies like BuzzFeed. But when I first started blowing up, I didn't think that I had to disclose that info. One, because I've always been like super private. And two, because my videos spoke for themselves. Like I was like, I don't need to like tell you my resume. If you think my video is good, you think it's good. If you think it's bad, you think it's bad. And what I always like, I always say my number one mission statement is to make people feel seen and heard. And I always when that specific video, it it was like my villain arc because I was like, I'll be fine. But there's probably a girl out there who's working, you know, a dead end job in the middle of nowhere who maybe didn't have access to a college education, maybe not even access to a high school education and they see TikTok or whatever platform comes next is like, this is my one chance at maybe having a career in makeup or trend forecasting or whatever it is. And, but if they see someone making a video saying that like Coco Moco isn't credentialed and she's a BuzzFeed employee with, you know, a college degree, like if she's not credentialed enough, then I don't stand a chance. I think though, if someone's saying that you're not credentialed, you're probably like doing something right because you're disrupting the industry in a way. And they're scared. Like, I feel like when you're disrupting, it's like, wait, but that's usually what's going to catch on that. I also think that they're projecting onto you something. And how about this? I don't think credentials are just from college. I think credentials can be found as a bartender. Yes. Learning energy, learning how to multitask, Mm -hmm. learning, learning how to engage with people and listen. 
I think credentials can be found working at McDonald's. There's, yes. there's different credentials, quote unquote, that you can get from interacting with people in certain industries. And also there's there's things maybe in your day to day life that don't even have to do with work where you can find credentials and you can put it together to create a certain kind of sort of career for yourself. I'll yeah. give you like a different like a counter, like something outside of the creator economy. Like when we started this business, a lot most of the people that that work in this business are young, like sub 25, mm-hmm. maybe a little older now because we've been doing it for a while. But when we first started doing this and at the time, like people were talking about podcasts, but not to the degree they are now. And so we didn't have like, I didn't have a list of like all these credentialed people that have been in other podcast businesses, or if they had been, they're usually like older and coming from radio. So I mostly looked to very young people that had mm-hmm. no experience or quote unquote credentials, but that just what I felt had like a good pulse on this type of digital content. And that's how we hired. Right. And, yeah. and so like, if we would have quote unquote gone for credentials, the, the company would not exist. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it truly, at least what I've learned even in like my path to, I'm at like almost a million followers. I think I'm at like nine, nine, eight. And I learned so much more from like my lunch breaks at work where I was just posting and like seeing what stuck versus like being in seminars or like I'll travel to seminars and panels and it's really great. And I learn a lot, but I learn a lot from just doing like, I think I always say behind every viral video is like 30 bad videos that you had to like private or like refilm. And that's like really like just doing. And I like whenever I was hiring people around me at my old job or were or having people come onto my team within the company, it was like I didn't really care about someone if they were like the A plus student that like like, of course, those people are important. But I just wanted the person who was like just like trying whatever they could and like just willing to be the first one to like volunteer to do the scary thing. I was like, that's the person who's like like going to find the next big thing. I know a lot of people with a lot of credentials that have absolutely no execution yeah. and don't know how to execute that are stuck. And I think that that conversation is not had enough. Yeah. If you cannot do like you just said, you are in your own way. Mm-hmm. And I don't give a fuck if you have all the credentials in the goddamn yeah. world. If you have all the credentials and you're not doing, it's not well, going to come. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. Like, listen, I, I, I don't want to knock a students. Mm-hmm. I am not an A student. <laughs> Neither um, but, was what, but what I would you say- You were flashing the principal <laughs> in detention but, but in I Saturday think, school. I think this is something that's interesting to observe and for people to really think about, especially if they're still in school. If, if you have spent the majority of your life being told and being trained that success means you get closest to a perfect score as possible. And then there's an opportunity where you have to go and you're thinking about trying something on your own. And there's, and it's very likely that you're not Mm going to get a perfect score. I mean, my first four or five businesses were disasters. Like it's just, (laughs) that's just what happens. Right. But if you're trained to think that success means you get a perfect score all the time, it is very hard to break out of that mindset and go and try things on your own. And so I sometimes empathize with people that have been taught that a degree in perfect scores on a test equates to success because in my personal experience and the entrepreneurs and people that I've met in the creator space or in in business, it's a lot of micro failures that eventually Mm -hmm. lead to a success. And I think if you're not equipped to handle that from an emotional standpoint, it becomes debilitating. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like, maybe I relate to that because I was like always like the kind of like not reckless in a bad way, but I was always just the kid that would like just had so much energy and just did everything And like two quotes to that of what you guys said that I love. One, I think was from Mark Cuban. He said, it it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. And then another one, I think it was from Victoria Paris. She's an influencer. And she said that perfectionism is a form of procrastination. And like those two, I just live by. Like I'm like, I just need to get like 10 bad videos out there. And then I'll have that one video that changes my life. Yeah, we know a lot of people that are in that perfection space where they like start to do something and they're getting ready to launch it. And then in their eyes, it's not perfect. So instead of launching and potentially failing, they go, ah, you know, I'm moving on to the next thing or I'm not going to try that thing. And, you know, I was listening to you talk and I think it's important for people to think about like, you could study your formula or our formula or another person's Mm -hmm. formula all day long, but it's not until you actually start doing the thing and getting Mm -hmm. a bunch of repetitions in that you can actually figure out what works for you. And so I, I think... To, to Lauren's point, a lot of people do themselves a disservice by thinking it needs to be perfect or they need the credential or they need permission to get going. Like I, we always say on this show, like launch fast and adjust because mm-hmm. the first 200 episodes were disasters. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like it's just how it is. Yeah. That's what are the trends 
<laughs> that are up and coming. Let's start with podcasts since we're here. What do you see in the next five to 10 years for podcasts? And you have your own podcast. So I think you're the perfect person to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I feel like at least right now, I'm seeing this resurgence of like live streamers that aren't just gamers. And I think that we're going to see someone crack the code to like, whenever I go to film a pod or even like a YouTube video, it's so hard. And like, no one talks about it. Like, it's literally like just learning that kind of realm is hard. And so I think that like a, a meta live stream of pod, like I was on I was filming a YouTube video recently and I put my phone in the corner of my desk and just live streamed on TikTok. And I didn't even acknowledge the TikTok. I I think in the beginning, I just told him what I was doing. And I was looking at the camera away from the phone. And like that TikTok live got more views than even the YouTube video. And I was like, whoa, like, I think that there's something there. That's super interesting. So like Mm -hmm. putting a camera up, not acknowledging. I've seen what you're talking about. And it's like live on TikTok and people can just... That's a really good way for people to find you too. Yes. And, and Mark. Yeah. And there's two things about live streaming. And I think we'll see more of that connection with podcasting. Um, but one, I always say with live streaming, it's not about entertainment, it's about companionship. People just want to be in the room with you. They're probably right. watching Game of Thrones on their TV and they just have it up. And also, if you think about the type of personality who's going to watch a live streamer, they like not in a bad way they probably have a lot of time on their hands. They might be a little bit lonely. Maybe they live alone for the first time. And they're probably adopters of new technology. So they're the ones who, when you announce that you have a Patreon or like some new app, they're going to be the ones that try it before everyone else because they were the ones watching live streams before everyone else. So I think we'll see more lifestyle live streamers blowing up that are like filming their podcast kind of in like a like a fly on the wall way. Damn, that is smart. That mm-hmm. is a smart Smart, smart theory. Thank you. TikTok. Let's pretend mm-hmm. someone is listening. They <laughs> have a hundred followers. They have no idea where to start. And they let's pretend like they hire you right now <laughs> to tell them what to do. Yeah. What tangible tips are you giving them? Yeah. So there's two that I always tell people when they're new. Number one is the nicher you go, the quicker you grow. And like, of course, people don't want to be put in a box, but if you're gonna stand out you have to have something unique about you. And like I always say, if someone is like, oh, have you seen the girl that does her makeup online? You're like, well, that could be anyone. But if you're like, have you seen the girl that does get ready with me's? You're like Alex Earl. Like, of course, she didn't invent that. But you have to have something unique that if a stranger on the street said it to their friend, have you heard of this person? They would know exactly who you are. And if it's too broad, it's not unique enough. Um, and then number two is just, I, I know people hate this, but it really is consistency um, because you have to train the algorithm. So like when you first start posting videos, the algorithm isn't going to know where to pump you out to. So it takes a few videos or even a few weeks or a few months of you posting. Like if you want to be a popcorn reviewer, like you're obsessed with popcorn and you post 10 videos about you reviewing popcorn, they're probably going to get no views. But eventually the algorithm's going to be like, okay, this person has posted 10 videos about popcorn. I feel like they're taking this seriously. I'm going to pump them out to 300,000 people who liked a movie snack video last night. So it takes time. Like I always say like the algorithm is like a, a robot on the other end. And you have to like tell them, what you want to make videos about. And then eventually they'll pump you out. But people put out one video and they're like, this is it. And nothing happens. It's not because it was a bad video. It's just that the algorithm like doesn't really know if you're like taking it seriously or not, or like what niche you're in. When you say consistency, I like to get very micro here. (laughs) Yeah. What would you suggest that someone does with a hundred followers? How often, what, like, what's the duration? Let's get really detailed. Mm -hmm. So for me, and at least brands I've worked with, I always say three a day, five days a week, not because it's even about the number, but because if you have to make three videos a day, it forces you to stop overthinking and spending an hour on one video. Like if you have to film three a day, you're like, okay, I have a 30 minute lunch break. Uh, That gives me 10 minutes to like quickly do a green screen video about something trending. So I like saying three a day because it forces people 
to have those off the cusp videos that are usually the most viral. But if you're like, make one a week, then they like, they just brainstorm. And then by the time they film it, it, it just, it, it feels forced. What are some things that you've seen go like viral, go crazy that you just can't even believe it? I mean, honestly, so many of live streaming, I'm like, what? Like, like, it's just a bizarre world. Um, there's a girl that makes candy. Yeah. Wh- like, who's that? The girl, she's like pulling taffy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bizarre. And like live streaming, like, isn't to the point of like TikToker fame yet. Um, I would say like anytime there's just something super niche, like there used to be this dog. I think it was named like Doug the Pug. And I don't know if you guys saw it, but they would call it like, is it a bones day? Like, it's just like a, it's like a saying that they would do. And if the dog was an elderly dog and if he woke it up in the morning and it stood up on its own legs, that meant it was going to be a good day. But if he stood up, dug the pug and then he fell over, it was like a bad day because he didn't have bones that day. So, I mean, I remember like. (laughs) It's like me every morning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I remember at work, like people would be like, is it a bones day or a no bones day? And like things like that are just so random but it like makes sense when it does go viral because you're like, duh, like, why didn't I think of that? Like, it's just so niche. Like, yeah. Where do you think that blogging is going and Instagram? Where do we, if you could predict in the next five years? It's so interesting you asked me that because I just finished reading Glossy, which is like the book. Did you read it? OK, I read it, too. Yeah. I mean, I I don't understand why. Like, I felt like everyone wanted that brand to fill. And I thought Into the Gloss was like so fascinating and such a cool concept and still is. Um, But I mean, in terms of blogging, I don't know. That's hard for me to say because I myself am not a huge blog reader. Like I read a lot of books. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe this isn't answering your question. I feel like we're just going to see a lot more influencers like publishing books and stuff because we were on this memoir kick right now. And um but I don't know about blogging. I just am not a consumer of it. Base. Guys, <laughs> luggage that is designed to fit everything effectively and efficiently. It was invented by actress and model Shay Mitchell. And she's just like all of us. She was looking for ways to make travel a breeze. She created Base, the perfect luggage that is fashionable and functional. Here's the thing. I really like this luggage because it's functional, yes, but it also is cute. So you get both things. I personally am a huge, huge fan of their cosmetic bag. It's always sold out. I actually saw it on TikTok first. I bought the black one, fell in love with it so much that I went back and bought the beige. How I use it is I'll travel with the black one. And then the beige one I use for my skincare. So I pack like my hyaluronic acid, my vitamin C, my mist, my castor oil, brow situation. I'll do my skinny confidential depuffing oil. Everything's organized in this case. And it sits in my car or the garage or even the laundry room so I can just grab it before taking Zaza to school. And sometimes they make Michael drive and I just like do my skincare and it's all perfectly organized with my base cosmetic case. I could not do it without this specific case. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so you don't have to worry about it in cargo or overhead. Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash skinny. Go to basetravel.com slash skinny for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash skinny. We have had some people on the podcast that have talked about water, water that you're showering in or water that you're bathing in. And they say it can be really, really hard on your hair and your skin. It can even give you rashes if it's unfiltered. So basically, when I heard that Canopy launched a new filtered showerhead, I knew I had to try it. So this one is dermatologist recommended. It's in a unique three-stage filtration system, and it gently reduces contaminants and odors in your shower water. So If you've been using unfiltered mineral filled water, maybe this is why your hair is dry or maybe you have like a dry itchy scalp or a rash. It could be from the water in your shower. This one is hassle free. I set it up myself in Zaza's room. I wanted to try it out to see if she liked it too. She loves it. And it has a unique quick release filter replacement feature, which allows for a seamless filter replacement. 
Go to getcanopy.co to save $25 on your Canopy filtered showerhead purchase. You should also know they make the best humidifiers on the planet and they have diffusers. Go to getcanopy.co to save $25 off your Canopy filtered showerhead purchase today with Canopy's hassle free filter subscription. Even better, our listeners can use code SKINNY at checkout to save an additional 10% off your Canopy purchase. Hurry, I'm telling you, your hair and skin will thank you. Go to getcanopy.co to save $25 off your Canopy filtered showerhead purchase today with Canopy's hassle free filter subscription. Do you know what's interesting for me, though, that I look at a lot? I think everybody's very aware of kind of like, quote unquote, the big names that break through. Mm-hmm. But again, being close to this space and sometimes being on the other side of the veil and seeing the businesses people have built. Like Lauren and I just spoke at a, a conference and there was 200 creators there, many of them not mainstream, but all of them are making seven figures a year, if not more. Yeah. And I, I always tell people this is like, do you really want to, this goes back to our fame thing. Like, mm-hmm. Do you really want to be the biggest or do you want to really build a business? Yeah. Um, and I think that like you read the headlines of like the Forbes 30 under 30 and 40 under 40, which to me is just a bunch of horse shit. You know what I mean? Like, I, I always think it's just like someone paid for that press. Um, but I, I, it's true. <laughs> Did I, you see my video about it? No, I didn't. No. But they had to change the article. Well, because it's just like, listen, like I know how to get like, it's e- like, if you want to go and you want to flip some numbers and like it's it, I understand those. I did see and your like, video on that. I did see your video. Not yeah. to diminish, but I know yeah. I know people that are in the creator economy that are maybe not as known, but mm-hmm. like they're powerful, building, powerful, and they yes. have substantial businesses mm-hmm. with a lot of revenue for many years. And so I think like again, like sometimes people their focus is like, can I be the most well known? And I think to your point earlier, it's like. The goal should be, can you really build a mm-hmm. living doing this for a long period of time? Yes. And have it be sustainable? Yeah. No, I, I 100%, I, I think that the um, creators that like really dive deep with their audience, like some creators will have 100,000 followers, but like those followers are so loyal to them that that's the equivalent of someone who has 10 million followers. And mm-hmm. like it's so, it's that discussion of like surface level fame versus like diving deep. And I, get, I always like to say the, all these different quotes. My manager calls them the Cocoisms. But like when it comes to fame or virality, like, do you want to be great at one thing or good at everything? And I think people that become very like surface level household names, sometimes it's because they're like they dip their toes in everything, but like they don't dive deep. And like maybe the people that dive deep don't have the most recognition, but they have the most power and like people show up. Like I think the biggest sign of how influential someone is, is if they can like throw a pop-up event and like people physically show up. Like that's crazy to me. Like that's so hard to do. I think a great example of that is Indy from Lonely Ghost, Indy and Brana. Yes. They've done a really, I mean, they have people, they did did like a haunted house and I think they had like a thousand people show up and they've built such an incredible community. And to Michael's point, you were saying that we spoke at that conference, like the, the people in that audience were very powerful with what they were doing. And maybe they don't have millions well, of followers. Well, I think my fear, my fear for a lot of people that are looking at this space and like maybe glamorizing it a bit mm-hmm. is like, I think it can also be really unforgiving. Like if you build yeah. a huge platform and then you have an audience abandon you and there's like, I, you know, we all know these stories like people like have this one calls it astronauts and they go super fast, rise to the top. Everyone's yeah. doing deals with them. Then they go away and it's like, you've had this level of quote unquote fame You've had a bunch of brands throwing money at you and then it's gone. So I think it's like, it's also really important for people to think about like when they're building a career in this space, like what they actually want to be known for. Like not just yeah. be known, or but they, what for. Or yeah. they get really popular really fast and they give their brand equity away too easily. So all yes. of a sudden you start seeing all these co-brands with every, like there's like 15 co-brands and they, they're they working with every single brand and that they can yeah. and slap their name on it and it ruins their equity. Totally. Like, I, I really do feel like your glass ceiling is like who you collab with. And the I interviewed recently uh, Greg Goodfried. He's tr- the D'Amelio's manager. And he he's like behind so many crazy internet lures. But he's one of those like mysterious, powerful people behind the scenes. And he said that part of the reason the D'Amelio signed with him is he told them, you're going to get a lot of offers. Like this is when they were blowing up in 2020. He's like, you're going to get a lot of offers from a lot of people. And it's not about what you can do. It's about what you don't do. And like, I'm the person that will tell you what not to do. And I was like, that is like the best advice. I think people get so excited and they want to do everything. But like the moment that you do a brand deal with like a hokey tea brand or like some random like thing that 
is a weird, you know, the product's not good or whatever. Like your fans don't really trust you anymore. I totally agree. And I think that that mm-hmm. conversation is going to be up and coming for like in the next 10 yeah. years. I think we're going to hear a lot of that kind of conversation. Mm-hmm. When you interviewed Charlie D'Amelio, her yes. first interview in 2019, what was that like? It was honestly, I actually, so um, I had been working with um, someone close to her recently and and I don't even know if she'd remembered, but I was at the event and I'm like, I don't know if you remember because, you know, my first name is this and that's how you knew me, but now I'm Coco and that's how you know me now. But like you, that interview that I did with you like changed my life. And so I really think of that moment is like why I'm in this room like that, like interviewing her was and I wasn't on screen. It was what happened behind the scenes. So I was at Famous Birthdays and I was when I got the job, I was assigned to run the TikTok. It was musically and then it switched to TikTok. And I remember thinking like this is going to ruin my career. Like at the time, everyone was doing Instagram marketing, YouTube marketing. And I was like, if I have TikTok on my resume, like no one's going to take me seriously. But I was like, I need the job. I'm just going to try it again, going back to like the person that just tries the new things and is like figuring it out before everyone else. And so I was on TikTok and then Evan Britton, the guy who founded Famous Birthdays, he was like, if you see anyone on your For You page who you think might be famous, like invite them in. Just like you have full invite control, whoever you think. And I remember it was when TikTok really started to take off in late 2019. And um, and then one of video Charlie's videos like were coming up on my feed And there also weren't that many videos back then. Like it wasn't. But anyways, but the moment I knew she was going to be famous is I saw people duetting her and like talking about her hype. And I always say that's like the the moment you have like a third party talking about you, not like a friend or a coworker, but like someone unrelated to you, they're going to be famous. So I emailed her and I remember she was like, hi, like I think my dad's coming to L.A. for business. Like I'm going to see if I can come with him. So we were like, "Okay, great. So then she came in and they filmed the interview with her and the video was starting to go so viral that I remember one of my managers being like, I don't know if these numbers are real. Like we thought YouTube was just like inflating our numbers, but I was like, no, I think she actually has this audience like and no one had 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 heard her talk before because she was blowing up dancing. So no one knew her voice, her mannerisms. So I think that was where the fascination from the audience came in. And then because of those videos, I remember she went on like a Gary Vee podcast a little bit after that. And he's like, when did you know you were famous? And I think she said something about like when Famous Birthdays reached out for an uh, invite. And then um, from there, I started working with her manager and her dad would reach out to me and be like, hey, we're in town. Like, can we come in for another interview? And we would just stop everything and be like, we would have to play it cool. Like on email, they'd make us be like, if we had the whole day free, we would have to be like, well, we have an opening at 1130 or like 215, <laughs> just so they thought we were important. I mean, I, I guess at that point we were. But um, so then when the millions would come in, we'd play cool, but like everything would stop. And uh, there was one video where it was Charlie and Chase Hudson, um, another TikToker. And I think right now it's at like 40 million views on YouTube, like wow. four zero, not 14. And that was the video that like, change the trajectory of my career just went so viral. And I was kind of the person behind the scenes that produced it. And then when I applied to Buzzfeed for an internship, I didn't get it, but I had that video listed on my resume and they reached out a month later and were like, Oh, like you made these videos. Like we're trying to figure out TikTok. Like, will you just come full time? So I got an even better job than the one I had applied for. The crew at BuzzFeed was asleep at the switch there for a second. Yeah, right. Yeah. (laughs) And it was like, I and I'm guessing they put like TikTok in the resume finder and mine came up and then I had the like data to prove it. But I always say like that, that the the videos that I made with the D'Amelios, like they might not even remember me or like I've, but like to me, like those changed my life. And I, I got to go to like the Sway House, which is so like the, it was like Bryce Hall and like Jaden Hostler, but um, it was like, a, it was such a time. And it was like right before COVID happened and Famous Birthdays was just getting the interviews with all these kids before they were like really taken seriously by like mainstream media. So it was like this little bubble. What marketing trends do you think are up and coming? Right now? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Go off. I think we're going to see the rise of like super long videos on TikTok, like the 10 minute feature. And I know that sounds crazy. People are like, I hate watching long videos. But I think that I said this um, earlier this year at a panel. 
I'm calling it short form fatigue. I think people are going to have short form fatigue on social media, which is like when I'm scrolling on my for you page, like I want to be able to just find a long video and then like brush my teeth like while it plays, you know, and like YouTube, sometimes the discoverability is really hard on YouTube and like podcast discoverability is even harder. Like I found like my few good podcasts that I love and listen to. But like I think TikTok, the videos are just so short. So I think that we're going to see audiences like in the next year in 2024, like we're going to see someone blow up on TikTok who makes like eight minute videos and like that's going to be their thing. That's not surprising to me at all. I think, you know, history kind of repeats itself. And I think Mm -hmm. what happens is this is maybe, I mean, now TikTok's aged up a bit, but it's a, I would think it's fair to say it's a younger generation of viewers. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens over time is your interests are broadened and you want more depth from the people you follow. And so you want more where it's like, a dance video at one point was enough, but then you're like, I want to know what you're wearing and what, yeah. you're, what you're thinking and what you're eating. And then like, you don't want that in a 30 second form. And where you're like, I need to actually hear what you're thinking about mm-hmm. this event or this day. I think that's just like the natural progression of things as people age up. Yeah. Well, and like from a user perspective, when videos are really short, like I, I hated whenever people would say, oh, Vine is big. Like people's attention spans are only seven seconds. It's like less than a goldfish. I'm like, I think it takes more brain power to like scroll every five seconds and your brain has to process a new video, a new face, a new caption, a new topic, a new maybe sentence structure, a new comment section. And you have to decide in a split second if you want to watch it. And so every five seconds, your brain is all this new info, 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 and it's exhausting. And I think that from a user point of view, they're just going to want to be able to open the app and find like long videos and enjoy them. And I, I even on the TikTok beta version, like if you go on their website on your desktop, they're testing out these podcast features. So I think there's going to be like a for you page, but like for podcasts. We're That's having- smart because sometimes I want to watch or sometimes I want to listen to a podcast when I'm like cooking or yeah. doing laundry or whatever I'm doing. But I also want to see the person. So to put on a TikTok would be mm-hmm. amazing. There's there's this book I read a long time ago and I always recommend it. It's called mm-hmm. The One Thing. And in, in that book, mm-hmm. it talks about how multitasking is a facade and how we're actually as humans not good at multitasking. Like if, if I said, hey, do this podcast, but then let's sit down and go over a spreadsheet and then let's sit down. <laughs> like your brain is not, it's yeah. not equipped to do that. And there's a, there's a guy we're having on the show named Michael Easter. And he just wrote this book called Scarcity Brain. And he's a lot of it's about this endless scrolling and how it's like, it's actually maybe not the greatest thing. Well, we know it's not the greatest mm-hmm. thing for the human brain. And so that doesn't surprise me at all because I think like I was in the car today and I was like, I find myself sometimes endlessly scrolling on something like this is useless and this is yeah. not feeding and I, and there's no takeaway because yeah. it's just so many things that I can't be like, oh, that one thing I'm taking something. Cause if I ask exactly. both of you, what are the last five videos that you I saw remember. scrolling, you guys cannot yeah. remember. Yeah, that's that's the, crazy. But, but if I asked like your last YouTuber podcast you clicked on, oh, yes. you know exactly who yeah. it was, why you would listen. Like there's just no object permanence on TikTok. Makes yeah, sense. And these platforms are really good about giving the dopamine hits. Mm-hmm. And so I think you get to a point where you're just like, people get so fatigued mm-hmm. because to your point, there's like not a takeaway, even though the video might be valuable. It's just too many. You can't remember. It's, there's no yeah. retention. I also think like how many people can you actually like consume when you're consuming like yeah. six million? It's like too many people. It's like pick your p- pick your players. Yeah, that's why sometimes like I'll get comments. It's so divisive, but I say the intro in some of my videos like, hi, I'm Coco Moco. I work in media, da, da, da. And it's so repetitive, but I do it because it like it's memorable. Like mm-hmm. people can m- remember it. I almost feel like it's hypnotic. And when someone sees a hundred videos, if they hear me say that like 10 times over the course of a month, they're going to like remember that. And so it, that intro doesn't work for everyone and it's not for every video, but it's just like a little thing that I do to try to like stand out and like people remember me. It reminds me of a jingle like yes. in the 60s, like oh, a wait, commercial. Like commercial. Like, like, commercials. Yeah, like what's a jingle? Like there's so many good jingles. Yeah. Like I remember like rice, a roni, yes. a San Francisco treat. <laughs> yes. Or I remember like Two and a Half Men, like Charlie Sheen's character was like a jingle writer. I don't know if you guys ever watched Two and I a Half Men. I didn't watch he, that show. Oh. <laughs> Charlie, was Charlie was Sheen was doing more than jingle writing. I know, right? <laughs> yes. He's jingling his balls. And yes. Charlie, come on the show, Charlie. <laughs> I know. That'd be a, a crazy podcast. Right? Um, what are, are there any other marketing trends that we should be paying attention to? No, I mean, I, I feel like, the, I guess I'll like, end on this note, which is so counterintuitive to like what I do, but I always try to say this to people, which is like, 
I like to report on trends. I think that they're really great benchmarks to look back in history and be like, this is why people's attention was on this thing or if you really want to stand out, like if you really, really want to build a loyal following, don't pay attention to trends. If anything, like do the opposite because people are going to have that itch for it. And like culture swings like a pendulum. So like like what we're talking about right now, everyone's doing short form TikTok, uh, you know, 30 second videos. But like the the pendulum's going to swing. So if you're the person doing eight minute videos and you have that muscle when the pendulum swings in six months, you're going to be the one that knocks it out of the park. So like, I guess like it's not even a marketing trend. It's just like a philosophy, which is like pay attention to trends so then you can give people what they're missing. Yeah, That is damn good advice. That is damn good advice. Before you go, what is a trend that you have predicted or trends that have been 100% right? I would say my first ever video that I did, I was talking about how I think the Tumblr, like aesthetic and just like, talking about Tumblr and stuff is going to come back full force. And I swear, like no one was talking about it back then. This was like last August or September. And since then, like the whole vibe has come back. Like the 1975 has trended again. Like Lana Del Rey is bigger than Tumblr. I'm like a Lana fan, but like she's had this resurgence of this new audience that didn't really find her from Tumblr. But like and uh, this one random sound on TikTok is trending and it's a G-E-Z Tumblr girls. It's literally called Tumblr girls. And like the aesthetic of like the like messy makeup and um, this kind of grunge like side bangs that was really big on Tumblr. Like, so I really think that just the Tumblr discussions and aesthetic and vibe, like I called it last fall, I guess, late summer. And I feel like it's been such a big trend this year. Yeah, but if you've been following, Kim just said Tumblr ty- or Tumblr Kylie's back. Okay. She said that yeah. Kim Kardashian. I think so. Oh. I think she said that. I know she said like King Kylie, but King Kylie Carson was Tumblr. That. Yeah, I'm pretty but, sure she said that. Michael, yeah. you don't even know what Tumblr is. I even said it wrong. Tumblr. I said Tumblr, but <laughs> yeah, Tumblr. When Michael <laughs> does a side bang, when you right. do it, do a uh, dashboard confessional. Carson, Google, side did bang. Kim Kardashian say Tumblr Kylie is back? Okay. I think she did. <laughs> Michael, and you're I'm spending trend, too, many, too much I'm time yes. scrolling. Um, where can everyone find you? Follow everything you're doing. Pimp yourself out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, my biggest platform, of course, is TikTok um, at Kokomoko. And hey, then, I was right. Carson says I'm right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Told you, Lauren. Get on the tram, Lauren. Yes. Sorry, and go, 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 go. no, you're so good. I'm happy that that was correct because I was like saying the word Tumblr, like that it was going to come back. And then anyways, um, and then my like ultimate pride, like where I really love making videos and my best quality work is my podcast ahead of the curve with Kokomoko. And that's where I get to like interview really cool people and dive into like whatever's trending and stuff. So I'm going to be uh, doing a deep dive on the glossy book in my upcoming episode and what I think about it. So, yeah. Thank you so much for Thank coming you guys. on. Thank, Thank you. you.